Hey, everybody, do me a favor. If you're listening to this on iTunes, give us a nice, big, wet, juicy review, will you? It'll help spread the word about the theater and the generous people that are on this podcast that give their time for our education every single week. Give us a great review. Thanks so much. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, Producers Perspective podcast listeners. Welcome back to the podcast. Okay, so I've been after today's guest to do a podcast since I started recording this thing. Please welcome to the podcast the legendary Broadway producer, Mr. Manny Eisenberg. Welcome, Manny. Thank you. So when I first asked Manny to do the podcast, he said, why would you want me? Well, here's why. He's in the Theater Hall of Fame. He's got a Lifetime Achievement Tony Award. He's got a whole bunch of other Tony Awards and Drama Desk Awards and all sorts of things on the mantle. He was Neil Simon's producer. He worked for the legendary producers David Merrick and Alex Cohen. He's got like 100 Broadway credits on his IBDP page. Check it out. He's like the oracle of Broadway producers. Whenever anyone in the industry has a question, they go to Manny. So... I'll start with some questions now. How did you get started in this business? I was interested in the theater because... Is there somebody shooting at us? It's, it seems to be. A rifle, rifle shots are going off. If this is the final broadcast, I'd like to say goodbye to my wife. So you started uh, I got as an actor. started because my uncle was an actor in the Yiddish theater. I grew up in the Bronx, and my sister and I would come down to Broadway and, and to Second Avenue, actually and go to the theater. So we became, we knew what the theater was, and I thought that, oh, if you could work in the theater, then you didn't have to work. Because working in the theater is a real work. It's fun. And what was Aggravation, the, but fun. And what was the first gig you had? The first job I had was on Broadway, was in 1959, The Legend of Lizzie. It ran two nights, and... I was back carrying liquor crates, actually. I worked six weeks, and I thought, oh, I was the assistant company manager, and I said, I can can do that. The next job was in Summer Stock, the Rye Music Circus. We smile when we say things like that. I didn't make, I made more money as a lieutenant in the Army until I was 31 years old. But I had a good time, actually. In the Army, I actually found out what work was, so I knew I didn't want to do it. So I went into the theater. It turned out all right. And you worked in, got started in company management and general management, right? I was right? company manager on The Legend of Lizzie, and then I was the company manager at the Rye Music Circus. And um, the Rye Music Circus general manager was Roy Somlio, who was Alex Cohn, turned and became Alex Cohn's general manager. So then he hired me to do the summer program at the O'Keefe Center in Toronto. And then David Merrick hired me to work on the Barbara Streisand musical, I Can Get It For You Wholesale. And Barbara and I lived in the same building, so it was kind of fun. And then I went on the road with I Can Get It For You Wholesale with Larry Kirk from West Side Story. And one thing led to the other. So when did you decide you wanted to be a producer? Was I it- never decided that. I still haven't decided that. Uh, it happened somewhat by accident. I was very content having a job. And... Uh, a fellow I worked with at the American office, Gene Walls, who isn't with us anymore, good guy, uh, he wanted to produce. So we worked uh, together at the American office. We did about maybe 25 shows for Dave America. And then we left in 1966, and Gene was going to produce. We went to general manage shows and produce them. So we general managed a straight play called The Impossible Years with Alan King which was terrible, but it ran for a year. Shows ran in those days. It wasn't three months or four months. And uh, and we produced The Lion in Winter. I was the general manager, but Gene had difficulty raising the money. So I helped him raise the money, and that was my first co-production. So you talk about working in for Alex Cohen and David Merrick. We've heard crazy stories about both of those guys. What was the best thing you learned from them? Well, the thing I learned the most was from, from the Merrick office. The Merrick office was extremely efficient, and they were all business. There was a time when Merrick had the nine shows on Broadway and God knows what on the road. In a three-and-a-half, four-year period, I did 17, 20 shows with legendary people, and 
you can't help but learn something. And the legendary people would be Chris Plummer and Tony Richardson and Talola Bankhead and Tennessee Williams and Albert Finney and uh, all sorts of and musicals like Oliver and Stop the World. So Alex was a great showman, but Merrick, for all his lunacy, had real taste. He also knew that despite all the publicity he got, it's really about uh, Tony Richardson doing plays and Gala Champion doing musicals. Because they were that. Whatever they wanted to do, he would do. What do you think David Merrick would think about Broadway today? He'd be jealous. There's a schadenfreude in this business that everybody falls for. But Merrick, uh, Merrick is quoted as saying, not only do I have to have all the hits, but everybody else has to fail. He was, I think, somewhat lunatic. lunatic. On the other hand, we did a lot of shows, and they were classy, well cast. Do you think our industry today has room for Merrick again, that style of producer? No. For whatever the reasons, there are 3,000 producers now. They'll build above the title. I haven't noticed that with most musicals, when they win the Tony, hundreds of people go on the stage. Some people you've never seen before. I had that experience in 1988. We won Tony, and there were a few people on the stage I'd never seen before in my life. What show? And they went up on the stage. What show was it? It was... Uh, Jerome Robbins Broadway. In fact, if you look at the ca- at the film of that, you see me doing a double tank, and I go, "What?" We'll have to dig that up on YouTube and put it in the in this blog so people can watch that. Those are people who put up the money, put up money, and uh, they put up money on the Schubert side. So the Schubert's why co producers. And what do you think of the number of producers that it takes to... Do you think it's helping us in terms of putting more money in? Does it hurt? It helps in terms of investment, but they used to be called investors. Now they call themselves producers, and it kind of diminishes the function of the producer because uh, there is a function called producer, and they're both aesthetic and managerial. And many if not most, if not all, of those people don't have any function other than putting in money. And and we do that to get the money. And we share the Tony with them. In fact, if you're not eligible for the Tony, you won't raise money. And then you have an argument as, can I go up and talk? So it's uh, distorted. And do you think we can ever put this issue back in the box? Do you, I've heard a lot of people talking about it, and I'm just curious if you think there's a solution to this problem. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a mortal wound. It's just representative of, uh, of a distorted, the distortions in the theater industry. So we've heard how Merrick thinks we'd be doing or what he'd think right now. How do you think we're doing, having been through that age and today? I think we made a, a, we didn't take care of the industry. We didn't take care of the aesthetics. It wasn't so long ago when you were around when plays ran a year and a half and then went on the road and then had a bus and truck company. Do you know how many jobs were at stake? If you list the Neil Simon trilogy, the Brighton Beach, Broadway Bound, and Biloxi, you'll see Nathan Lane, Matthew Broderick, Jason Alexander, Johnny Cryer, Robert Sean Leonard, one after another. Dempsey, the kid Dempsey, the big star, he was on the bus and truck of, of Brighton Beach Memoirs. So, or Broadway Bound, one or the other. So the, the theater provided jobs, and we don't have tours anymore. We don't have shows going on the road. We don't have shows with bus and truck. And they only run three months or four months. So that's a diminish, a real diminishment. And that would depend upon stars coming in. If the star gets paid, then he gets $100,000, and the rest of the cast gets minimum. Or if Al Pacino says, listen, I understand there's a problem, I'll take minimum. That means all the other actors get minimum. You don't build a community on a four-month run. So good actors go out to California. So what what did we do that caused this 
to happen. He we, said we don't. We didn't take care of it. The plays needed nurturing. You have to nurture playwrights. You have to have a place for them to go, like the National, place that has uh, you can make a living and has aesthetic cachet. Tom Stoppard wants his plays done at the National because it's classy. Well, we used to be classy. We're not classy anymore. I, I looked at a resume of uh, some actors came in for some audition for something, and they listed their films first, television second, theater upon request. Upon request? Upon request. Like a voiceover conflict? So it's not that important anymore. And it used to be the queen of the arts. The era of uh, Jason Robards and uh, Eugene O'Neill and Williams and Miller. So it's, uh, I think, sad. And we, we're, we're much more of a theme park as far as musicals are concerned than art. There are exceptions. Hamilton is a giant exception. Somebody will come along and do something. Hopefully it'll be the artists. Management won't. The theaters won't. The reunions won't. But the, if Meryl Streep decided that there should be a national theater and there should be three of them built on 11th Avenue and 18th Street, and uh, the vested interests that are uptown are not participating downtown, then perhaps we'd have theater as part of the culture again. What do you think the most important characteristic is of a producer? Sensibility. One, let's assume he has a certain amount of taste. And then the recognition of who is it that you're dealing with. And Neil Simon is one man, one personality. A Tom Stoppard is another personality. And Sondheim is another personality. And you have to cater to, to the strengths of those personalities. So, for example, this is your lesson, that report. I'll take it, please. Uh, when we did the real thing, the Tom Stoppard play, which is a first-class play, we were all terrified that he'd ask your opinion because then you actually have to have one. None of this second... The second act needs work, you know, and all those banalities. So I was sitting in the back of the theater in Boston and there's a tap on the shoulder and there he was. What do you think? And I sort of blurted out. Ten minutes into the second act, I wasn't paying attention was looking at the theater and he nodded his head and he said maybe you're right and five days later he came back and said is it better so perhaps what a producer really should do is to tell the author that he's not engaged this is where you don't engage me I'm not paying attention don't tell him how to write it because you can't intrude on the, the lunacy of that process but producers do go around telling them fix this and do that and what that's a mistake most, most authors are intuitive. They don't know what the hell you're talking about. And they'll be defensive. No, you're going to waste, they're going to waste 30% of their energies on defending against your criticism. And you don't really know that what you're suggesting works. In my experience, Neil Simon was different than Stoppard, and Stoppard was different than Fubar. So you have to develop confidence of the artist that he trusts your objectivity and your visceral responses enough to ask you your opinion. And if he doesn't trust you, he's just going to be defensive. Even if you're right, and we don't know that we're right, we're guessing. We also don't know what the process is for that that author. And you have to be able to recognize most of them being intuitive. Even Stoppard is an intuitive writer. So Neil Simon, for example, could write a 33 pages and give me the play to read. And if I said, I don't know, I'm not sure, he'd put it aside, take it out a year later, and as if, who wrote this? That's how intuitive he would be. He said, wow, look at this. He forgot what it was the day he wrote it, or the week he wrote it, or the month he wrote it. It was a different experience. I'm, I'm exaggerating to a certain extent, but, but I'm pretty sure that, that I know that the three of them don't lay it out. They just write and you had a very long relationship with Neil Simon. How many years? How many shows? It's about 22. And what do Something you... Something like that. Maybe 19, maybe 24. I don't know. Who counts when I you get I haven't counted. Someday I will. 
And what do you credit the strength of that relationship to? And how important do you think it is that a producer have a relationship with a writer like that, that they stick with over time? It was almost like you were a, well, you were making lots of money, but it was almost like you were a nonprofit committed to one artist and doing everything that he did. You know, part of the condition of doing his plays was that I do other things. He did not want me to be dependent on him. So he said, do whatever you want. And I did, obviously. I met Neil by accident. I, was, uh, I played baseball with Robert Redford. Redford played first base, I played shortstop. And when Redford came to New York with Barefoot in the Park, he called up and said, we could play on our team. Neil played second base, I played shortstop. And that's how I met Neil Simon. So you can attribute all the oxy crafty stuff, but it had to do with the fact that I can pick up a ground ball and throw it first. You, Redford, and Simon are the same baseball team. Redford played first base, Neil second, I was shortstop. Carmine Caridi played third base. Bobby Morse played left field. That's what happened. It's a Neil Simon play right there. And the seven years later, and my, my, why would go to, he would invite us to the openings. You know, in those days, opening night was opening night. You put on a tuxedo and the critics came that night and the reviews were in that night. And about five or six or seven years later, he called up and asked me would I produce the play. I, being a clown, said, I don't know, let me think about it. But his wife had just had was diagnosed as uh, metastasized cancer, and she died. And uh, they were unhappy with the previous management, so they, they were clearing the decks for the last year of her life. It was somewhat very sad. And the first play was The Sunshine Boys. When you, th- I don't know, I'll, th- I'll think about it, about doing any play, musical, project, what do you think about, what's your process for picking a show to do? Well, one of the things you don't want to say is uh, um, you're intimidated by the artist. So if it's a real playwright, you better pay attention. So if Stoppard sends a play or Fugard sends a play or Sondheim writes a musical, you pay attention to it. But my, my fundamental criteria would be make me laugh or make me cry. Those are my visceral responses. And if you can make me laugh and cry, I'll, I'll do your play. We'll deal with what the play's about and the intellectual objectivity and all the other crap that we talk about and, and pretend we know. But the visceral responses, that, that's a, it's a fundamental emotion. If you read a Neil Simon play and it's funny, it's funny. Some of them were sad and funny, but... Broadway Bound, which I think is his probably best play. He set out. He said, he said I'm going to make them laugh and cry within a minute. It, it's perfect, purposely. And he did. You think it's easier for a producer to get started today than yesterday? How do you want to define producer? If you want to be a producer and you don't have any money, it's, a, it's very difficult. These days you have to have a lot of money, or you have to have access to a lot of money. But look at who automatically becomes producer. People with a lot of money. The qualifications for a producer, those managerial ones which are marginally respected, and the aesthetics, which are most people are afraid of. You don't want to turn to most producers and say, you don't really know what you're doing, but you, you think that your participation in this project is going to make you more fulfilled or something. I don't know. I don't quite get the motivation of uh, many people who are built above the title because it's a, their participation is a delusion, and yet they do it. So I think it's more difficult. It's also there are not too many things you put your name on that would go on the resume of your soul rather than just a project. There are some things that uh, you're very proud that you produce and proud quietly that uh, satisfies your ambitions. Any of those shows that you read or looked at that made you laugh and cry that didn't work? Oh, absolutely. First one of the first ones I ever did. What was it? 
was Carl Reiner's play, Something Different. I thought that would be a big success, and it failed. Um, Groucho Marx thought it was funny. He told, he got the, made the audience stand up and say, this is funny, I know what funny is, but the critics didn't think so. And I did uh, a, a repeat of Brighton Beach Memoirs, and I thought it was the best production of that play ever, and that didn't work. Ragtime, a couple of years ago, that didn't work. Sideshow, that didn't work. All of which I thought were first class efforts. And I would put that unashamedly, all of them on my resume. There are three or four shows I did that I would not put on my resume, but I'm not going to tell you. So when one of those shows that you're so proud of that made you laugh and cry doesn't work like that, how do you get out of bed the next morning and do as uh, so many other shows that you've done? Good question. When I did something different, I committed to it emotionally. I was young. It was the second show we produced. And I thought that would be a winner. And your description of how do you get out of bed in the morning, that's what happens to you. When you have a loser, you sleep later. You can't face the day, so you get up at 11 instead of 6. And after I did that show, I knew, actually said, I am no longer ever going to emotionally commit like that. And I never did. And I had winners and losers. That, that it's not an easy blow to like something, commit to something, and we don't we don't blame the critics. You know when the audience isn't going to come. Some things, Lion Winter, uh, paid off. It took eighteen years. The stock and amateur paid off. Susan Stroman did. Uh, Scottsboro Boys, which I thought was one of the best things I'd seen in ten years, and that didn't work. I don't know what that answer is, but uh, you deal with it. As my wife said, when we produced Ragtime and it failed, she looked at me and said, nobody died. It's only a play. And that reality uh, doesn't affect my children. It's not a disease. It's only a play. We do seem to recover, though, don't we? So you literally have figured out a way to box up the emotion or check it whenever you sign on to something so that it won't affect you put either it in, way. You put it into a perspective. So you don't go crazy if it's a winner, and you don't... It's a blow when it doesn't work, but you put it into perspective. It's not war, it's not death, it's not sickness, it's not illness. It's a play that didn't work. Two years later, you think about it and you put it into that perspective. So do it a little earlier. It's like a relationship. Also, don't finger point the reason the critic there is. You blame the critics, you blame the theater, you blame the stagehands, you blame the actor, you blame something. You don't, don't want to blame your taste or your judgment with not taste. You expect every show you do to work, don't you? Sure. This is a business that was built, it seems, on the independent producers, the Merricks, the Coens, the Eisenbergs, developing these relationships. Lately, we've seen some big corporations come into the game, the movie studios, television studios. What do you think about these big corporate giants jumping into our pool? I think in the long run, it's, uh, it's no good. Not all of them are bad guys by any means. They're good guys, but they have their own corporate interests. The corporate corporations that are coming in have films that they want to make into musicals because Lion King worked and Wicked worked, so everybody's trying to emulate it. Very little. There's a lot of talent around, but not a lot of artistry. So all those com all those corporations are asking you to take their library of news of films and make it into a musical. So you get talented people, but the creations are, are hardly legendary. There's no West Side Story, and there's no Fiddler, and there's no Rogers and Hammerstein. Some of it is talented. The art of the theater is not being nurtured, differentiating from talent. Mm, yeah. They're hired guns. A movie company calls you up and says, uh, listen, I have this movie, it's, uh, it's a Shane, it's a Western, and we'll give you $200,000 to write the book. So you do it. It's not the way collaborations for the theater happen. 
the old those musicals were done those great musicals were done because the artists got together did it and then presented it to somebody it's now the producer gets it and then says why don't we make a musical out of it well all the others were created by uh, the artists and then presented to the producers that's an excellent point including the biggest hit we've seen in a long time Hamilton is an artist driven absolutely piece no studio could have come up with that concept or executed it in that way. Learner and Low, My Fair Lady. I would have liked to imagine what what writer a studio executive would have gone to to write the book to Hamilton. Uh, I, Lynn Manuel is a friend, and when he said publicly that uh, he thought that when he read that book that you know that there would be thirty eight people wanting to make that into a musical, <laughs> he said Lynn. You're the only one in America who thought that Hamilton would make a musical. Now I'm sure we'll see musicals called Lincoln, you know, Buchanan. What was the price of a Broadway ticket when you, on that first show you worked on in 1959? Do you remember? Well, I, I don't remember that, but I remember that the top ticket price in 1962 was Forum. Funny thing happened on the way to Forum was $9.20. And when Chorus Line opened in 75, I think, the top ticket price on Broadway was $15. So add that to the mix of what's happened to the theater. People aren't going to go to the theater for $300 to watch and see a play that they don't know is good or not. God knows how much they're paying for musicals these days. So we haven't contained that either. We've answered every one of our economic problems by raising the price instead of dealing with the problem. And what's that problem? It's a whole host of them. Everything is outpriced, overpriced. Ken, you want to do a straight play? How much will the scenery cost to do, you know, a one-set play? $500? 500000 Approximately, right? Never mind the, the cost of putting it up. For 500000 plus another $300,000 for the labor, maybe more, you can have a home built that will last 300 years be made out of not paper mache, and they would have plumbing. I never thought about that. Think about that. Comparing it to real estate. And to take in the labor to put it up, let's say it's $400,000, and the bid that you get from the scene shop is $500,000. On $900,000, you're going to have a mansion with electric wiring, plumbing, maybe even some furniture. So do you think that's a distortion? Of course it is. When I add up the rest of it, everybody is somewhat overpaid. Can we keep it down now? This is my big question because, of course, as a company manager and general manager myself, I follow your same no. path. No. You have to create something new that is not beholden to the vested interests. You cannot be beholden to the management, the producer, and his preconceptions of what he should make and what he's entitled to, nor the real estate, God knows, nor the stagehands, nor the union, and you know the details of our business. We have a thing called the net gross. That's like a Jewish Catholic. The net gross. You ever hear of a bigger oxymoron? And we buy into it. And some people get paid on the gross gross. But we get paid on the net gross. What kind of madness is that? The net gross. Go tell a mathematician and an economics major. You have an expression called the net gross. It's more the moron of the oxymoron is who we are. Okay, so this is the first of uh, one of my James Lipton-like questions. I want you to imagine that the Smithsonian Institute calls you and says, Manny... You've produced so many shows. We have room for one of your shows in the Institute. Which one would you choose? Only one. I get only to the only one. one, the real thing, the Star Wars play. How come? Uh, one, because I think he's the best playwright of the last 30 or 40 years in the English language. The experience of doing that play was spectacular. I got married because of the philosophy of that play. And I learned how to produce when we did that play. I also learned uh, how to maintain an equilibrium in your life. 
So there's that. Sounds like what a great play should do. Entertain and also educate. It's also, I think, I think he's a great writer. He's also a first-class guy. That was easy, Zach. I have a quick answer. I mean, I've had people on this podcast that have produced like three or four shows. They couldn't pick one. You produced well, the ones that, uh, there are shows I've had a good time on. I mean, some of the Neil Simon shows, we were on the floor. I mean, yes, Sunshine Boys was an experience. Rory Mallon. But to watch him, he could make people laugh. He actually knew what he was doing. It wasn't He pretended not to. How was dealing with him different than dealing with Stoppard? Did you, do you find yourself having to adjust your personalities for these artists, whether it's Lin-Manuel, whether it's Neil Absolutely. Simon, or are you just the same guy? No, and- you, get, you should be very objective and very observant of what, this, what the personality of that playwright is, how, how he deals with um, his life. So Neil and I came from the same neighborhood, so we could joke about things like that. And the same rhythm. What was funny? When he would write, you know what words are funny? Words with a K in it are funny. Pickle is funny. Cucumber is funny. Kai Kai Kyler is a funny name. Robert Taylor is not funny. Then you knew what we could laugh about that. Stoppard was, you had to figure it out. But I had the big advantage on, on the real thing. Mike Nichols was the director, so. And whereas I had to work hard to find out what that play was about, Mike actually knew about it when he read it. He was an intellect. The ability, you have a responsibility with play, right? He gives you the play and he says, what do you think? You want to produce it? Well, a couple of plays I said no to. And one was God's favorite. I said no for about a year and a half, two years. And he kept taking it out of the drawer. And I finally said, okay, let's do it. And he said, why? And I said, we'll exercise it. We'll just get it out so you can go on to something else because it's eating you up. So that's recognizing what's... He wrote that play when his wife died, and it, it was an angry one. I wouldn't presume to tell a star, but I I worked hard at finding out what his plays were about. For example, there would be the relative values of almost everything, relative value of science, relative value of relationships. And then, so you could read the plays better. Unfortunately, I think that probably only Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, that was a film I, we did, but Rosencrantz and Guildenstern as a play and the real thing as a play are the only two real successes, commercial successes he's had, and yet he's a great playwright. We've talked a lot about the writers. Mike Nichols, that's the first mention of a director that has come up. How important is the director in the creation of a new play or a new musical? Uh, important if you're Mike Nichols, but Mike didn't intrude on when they When Neil wrote The Prisoner of Second Avenue, they had no ending. And they sat in the lobby of the hotel in Boston, and Neil said, well, what should I do? And Mike said, how the hell do I know? I'm the director. You're the writer. You figure it out. Didn't, don't intrude on that, on that process. Because I'm sure Mike must have had an idea, but he checked Mike, it. Mike was great with the actors and great objective critic. He didn't write it for the audience. When, we, when Mike did the real thing, uh, he wouldn't dare to intrude on. But he he knew he knew what the play was about, and he can get actors to do what they couldn't do otherwise. He was a guru. In fact, he said so. He said that that's what we do. Directors do. We seduce. We seduce the actors. Sometimes literally and figuratively, in addition to figuratively. But you teach. But he was the best. He was the best that I've ever worked with. You teach producing now. You have for no. I, I teach a course. At, at, I taught a course at Duke for twenty five years, which was about really. I gave them plays to read and. Uh, and ask them for visceral responses, their real opinions, not the ones that they think will please everybody. That came out of an experience at Yale. I gave them Brighton Beach memoirs to read, the graduate students at Yale. And they found it odious and loathsome because it was written by Neil Simon and it wasn't Chekhov or Strindberg or Ibsen. And then the play opened and was a big success. So I went back and got even with them. 
told them I didn't think they were the brightest kids in America because they were spitting back other people's opinion. And from that time on, I, every time I gave them a play, I ripped the cover off. Now you don't know who wrote it. Now tell me what you really think. I knew that this was the case because a kid came up, a student, a graduate student came up after the class, a girl, and told me that she really liked the play, but was afraid to say so. So with that idea, I talked to a Duke for, I gave him over a semester, 30 plays to read. They'd have to write single space, one page visceral responses. And the goal is that you have to have the confidence of your own opinion, because the theater is sub totally, totally subjective. The arts are totally, you like this music, I like that music. And it's very dangerous for the bright kids to think that they must give back a, uh, an accepted opinion. And if you do it when you're young, you're going to keep doing it. You don't wake up at age 35 and say, Chekhov is boring. Or Shakespeare is uh, difficult. Well, you also have to have that, that, that Chekhov is boring, and Ibsen is boring, and Strindberg is boring, and Shakespeare is boring. And then you see it with a good cast, and you go, oh. So the classics have to be done by classically good actors. Otherwise, it's boring, but you're afraid to say so. I saw Lear three times when I was young and was bored. And then I saw Peter Brooks Lear with uh, Schofield. And I, wow. Oh my. So I think that's a, those are valid experiences. So just so I'm clear, you gave a class at Yale, yes. Brighton Beach, before it opened on Broadway. Right. And they just made, as a test. Right. And and they, here's a play. Read it. And they dismissed it completely. And then it was a And it only ran three and a quarter years. It's the 10th, 11th longest running Broadway show ever. And the Yale kids, well, they had professors there. They had Bruce Dane Gilman and Kaufman, all of whom were committed to great intellectual efforts. And no bright kid at Yale is going to say, I saw Chekhov and it was boring. Don't we know a lot of people like that? Right? We certainly do. And don't we know ourselves when we go to see it and you walk out and you go, yes, that was interesting, and your head is going from left to right to make sure nobody hears you? But there's also the, the actual the subjectivity of all of our tastes. Tom Stopper doesn't like classical music. They're going to do, call him an idiot. Advice to young writers starting today? Write for television. <laughs> That's what they do. If you have, you're 28 years old and you write a play and it's done at the uh, O'Neill Center, right? And people say, it's not bad. Your agent says, listen, I can't get you, I can't get your play on, but I can get you $20,000 a week writing uh, for 22 weeks writing some series on cable. Goodbye. And then they go. 15, 20 years later, they want to write a play and they can't do it anymore. There are geniuses, I suppose. But I think playwrights also learn that the early plays of all Williams and Miller aren't as good as plays later. Okay. We, we don't nurture them. We don't take care of them. My last question. It's called my genie question. You ready for it? I'm braced. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you and says, Manny, I want to thank you so much for everything you've done. You've, you've been through it. Uh, you were in Korea. You worked for David Merrick. You have done more shows, and we want to thank you for that by granting you one wish. I want you to ask yourself, what's the one thing that drives you so crazy about Broadway that keeps you up at night, that would have you banging on this desk right now? The one thing, I know there's a few things that may drive you crazy, but the one thing that makes you so mad that you would ask this genie to wish away in an instant. Well, I think we should have a national theater in which the economics are shared in a totally different manner. So that the actors and the artists, they don't have to get paid millions, so that you can have an ongoing, classy, cultural part theater. Theater is part of the, of, and developed. Is an American cultural, important part of American culture. Because it, the sad, um, it's sad watching Broadway go down aesthetically. And it goes down relatively slowly. And nobody does anything about it. We'll talk, some people talk about it. Some people pretend it's okay by quoting numbers. More people went to the theater last year. I don't know where the hell they get that stuff from. 
More people want the musicals, maybe. But when you have musicals that are running 25 years, that's a theme park. Well, Shirley, we had a good time last year in that Phantom. Let's go see the damn thing again. It's like going on a ride at Disney World. We had a good time last time. We'll do it again. Stop Art, I'll give you a conclusion. When I was at Duke, Stop Art came down and gave us a talk. And he was asked why he went into the theater. And Stop Art is great with language. He just comes up with stuff, which is extraordinary. But he said that he went into the theater because it was the matrix of his moral sensibility. Everybody applauded. Nobody knew what it meant. The matrix of your moral sensibility. And over the years, it just dawned on me, of course, he was so smart. You go to the theater instead of going to church or to the synagogue. And in the old days, you put a suit on. You didn't eat M&M's. And if it was good, it was a revelation. It was like being Martin Luther King giving you a speech. You showed that to the salesman. You said, I'm going to, I can, I'm going to, I'm You could barely talk. You're going to change the world. That's what the theater is supposed to be. And it's much less now. But I can point to five or six moments when I walked out of the theater. That why, that's why you went into the theater. That's what you aspire to. You wanted to be a part of that thing. So Hamilton did that. Look at look at look at the responses that Hamilton has from kids. But I can't name anything that's done that for a new generation in the last fifteen, twenty years. For me, when I went back to see salesman that Mike did before it before it does Philip Seymour Hoffman, I walked out and I had to walk two or three blocks before I could talk. Because that was it. That's a home run. But it's that's where you got your moral sensibility. That's where you got your aspiration. Theater did that. It doesn't do that anymore. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today, finally. And I want to thank all of you out there for listening. But Manny, you know, you mentioned Mike Nichols being a guru. You are a guru. You're an inspiration to me and to so many of us in this industry. So thank you well, so much. I think that's... One of the things you're going to have to deal with, it's a problem. you get cured. I'll work on it. Thanks to all of you for listening. Until next time, this is Ken Davenport with the Producers Perspective Podcast. Oh.